Okay, good morning. So in OpenBSD, we got quite good and quite efficient in writing free, functional, and secure software. So we do have time to uh, also produce release artwork and write funny songs. And when we get out of our web basement, we travel to all these beautiful places <laughs> where we come together to hang and to hike. But when we travel there, we, we enter all these weird Wi-Fi networks, like you go to an airport where you have free Wi-Fi, but you need to fiddle with the DNS settings because everything is terrible. You go to the hotel, and they, they present you with the captive portal where you need to click a thing and you fiddle with the DNS again. It's really annoying. So imagine we have a piece of software that, that takes care of this, that does this uh, automatically, and no matter where you are, no matter how harsh the current conditions are. <laughs> so who am I and why am I standing here? <clears throat> I'm an OpenBSD developer since uh, 2012. I mostly wrote uh, previous separated uh, demons. Um, I also poked at uh, the, the kernel and the network stack there. And for a living, I run uh, DNS servers. So that's a good combination there. Uh, I work at the Rock NTC, which is a European non-profit, and we run one of the uh, root name servers, and we also run a, another cluster that we call OSDNS, which basically serves uh, all the reverse zones, or the delegation for all the reverse zones on the internet. These are uh, heavily anti-costed, so we have uh, many instances. Um, root name servers, that is where all the DNS starts. They're Certain servers worldwide, they're identified by letter, A through M, so root servers with that. They're all any constant, so that's not just 13 physical machines, there are thousands about. I'm very proud of that we have this K over there in Greenland, that's quite neat. And this is what it looks like to be a root name server. Basically, you have to answer real fast, yeah, that thing that doesn't exist. That's the red one. That's about um, 100,000 answers per second that say that thing does not exist. And we have about 20, uh, 25,000 answers per second. Yeah, go over there. Ask that. I need to give you a quick introduction to DNS. However, uh, according to um, Bert Hoover of, of PowerDNS, the combined knowledge of DNS is written down in about 2,000 to 3,000 pages of RFCs. And it grows by two pages per week. <laughs> do you have some time on that? So, yeah, I can't do that. Um, so there's, there will be accuracies in here, there will be lies, and there will be omissions. But this is more about to get a mental picture on how this stuff works, not about how can I actually implement the DNS server. So think of it as a a distributed, hierarchical uh, key value database. There's a key value here. So you have a tuple, dot, 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 on that org. That's the name. And a type, A, stands for address, which maps to an IP address. You can also turn this around and put this into DNS to get from an IP address to a name. These are not actually connected. You can put in there whatever you want. To arrive at that, you flip the IP address around um, at inadvertent.r product, and you get that. And the thing looks like a tree. It starts with the root, you know, by a dot. And it means there you have what's called top level domains, like com.org, Canadian top level domain for, for the countries in there, or ARPA for, um, for infrastructure. And every one of these circles denotes an entity that's, that's, um, that's responsible for this. And that's also the way you get to the hierarchy. So there's an entity that's responsible for or. And that entity then knows how to get to uh, other entities at all. You have, for, for DNS, various servers. The, the first one you need is an authoritative name server. 
that is the source of truth for a um, particular part of the hierarchy, like the root zone, the org zone. And this server either knows the answer for a, for a question, it knows that there is no answer, it knows there might be an answer, go over there, ask them, or it knows, well, you ask me something that's really not my thing to say, and it refuses to answer. Another piece of, of server is the recursive name servers. And these are the complicated part. They know how to navigate this, this hierarchy, this tree. And then there's a lot of piece. You're on your laptop, <coughs> and you want something resolved. And yes, um, then you have the, the C library, uh, which the entry points there are used to get entry info and get name info. These things then know how to talk to a recursive name server. And that recursive name server, which wants to talk to, is uh, configured in uh, adsyresolve.com normally. So if you want to get an um, IP address for dot 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 it looks like this in C. And since this is an example, it leaves out all the error handling. Look at the OpenBSD command page, which explains how to do this properly. <coughs> so that thing uh, went off to the recursive resolver, and uh, then the recursive resolver needs to do some work. And that work starts with, hey, root zone, dot, 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 on you know, have you heard of that? But hang on, how, how is it, what is it talking to now? Uh, this is a chicken and egg problem. It needs to know where the root is. The, the solution for that is it's built in. Uh, every recursive resolver has a list of root name servers and IP addresses built in. Uh, so yeah, uh, it kind of knows who to talk to. So it does this, da 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 on every org root zone. Have you heard of it? No, not quite, but I have heard, heard, heard of org. Maybe ask those people over there. They're at d0.org.affiliate-nft.org. Wow. But they're also in .org. So, Here's also an IP address, which gets sent along to, so, so that you know who to actually talk to. So we do that. Hey, Art, dot, 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 I let you know, have you heard of it? Yes. Ask those people in the Netherlands. And I'm not going to tell you where they are, because, well, they're in the Netherlands. I have nothing to do with that. <laughs> so we go back to uh, the room. Have you heard of them? Yeah, 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 they're in the Netherlands. Go out to people in the Netherlands. <laughs> hey, have you heard of them? Yeah, 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 they're here. Go ask them. So we go to that uh, and ask them, uh, have you heard of this? Yeah, 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 it's over there. And now you can uh, read the OpenBSD blog. That was actually quite complicated. Have you noticed how we told everyone that we want to go to dot, 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 on .org? That's a bit um, excessive. If people figured this out, this actually quite recently only, um, in terms of well, reasoning on the internet. Um, this is actually not a good thing. So what we can do is the recursive resolver can guess which parts it needs to send, which is, works mostly OK. It has a few quirks, but yeah, it just works most of the time anyway. So we do this. Uh, we ask the root zone, hey, Org, where is that? Yeah, it's over there. Hey, Org, have you heard of uh, Alertis.org? Which is a bit silly, because they probably can figure out that you want to talk to the web server, but if it's uh, something like supersecure.internal.company.thingy, might be helpful. But the upper, uh, certainly is that uh, me as a root server operator, I don't want to know that you go to uh, I don't just want to care, it's just want. <laughs> we'll be okay. <laughs> so DNS itself is completely un 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 uh, authenticated. You just get an answer, you don't know what it means. Um, the DNS actually yeah. told this. You get uh, origin authentication, which means the, the thing that I get, I'm, I'm sure that it comes from the person that's supposed to come from. Uh, integrity uh, means what arrived here, nobody on the path matched with it. Um, the denial of existence is uh, assigned as well. The upfront here is that nobody can fake that the thing does not exist, which is also important. However, it doesn't give you uh, confidentiality. So, uh, the, the, part, the, the answers are not encrypted, the path uh, to uh, the server is not encrypted, so everybody can still see what you're doing. <laughs> there are a few new things that one can do with DNSSEC, and uh, I really like this one. <coughs> DNSSEC follows the hierarchy of DNS, which means 
that not everybody on the internet uh, with a used car dealership can sign everything <coughs> like in TLM. Uh, it, it follows the hierarchy. So whoever is responsible for .org cannot sign things for .com. And there's a provision in, in uh, DNS to bind uh, a certificate to a name in DNS to make this uh, more secure. However, for this to work, and nobody really tackles it without terrible hacks, is you need to do the validation on your local machine. Otherwise, you, you run into a stupid problem. Um, to do with things like this. Like, so, <clears throat> if you don't do it on your laptop, uh, and you, 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 you ask a, a recursive name server, uh, please do the DNS validation for me. Why do I trust that? And why do I trust the path to that? Um, this is easily solved by just doing it on your laptop. However, uh, that, that is a bit problematic. The first thing that we notice is you need an accurate clock because a DNSSEC signs um, in an in a, a interval. So the, the signature is only valid for this period of time. Someone, so you, you, you're on your laptop and you move it around, you don't control the network, so someone might uh, actually do active filtering. Um, like everybody knows that DNS is port 53, it's uh, 512 bytes and uh, UDP. So middle boxes might try to filter other things that they don't know about. Or maybe you have a recursive name server uh, configured by hand that just doesn't, for, for operational reasons, doesn't support it, and then you also don't get um, uh, the, the required records for, for DNS. Work. This was also a thing that we actively ran into. <coughs> so you can also say, well, don't do that then. But the point is, I want this to, to work automatically. I suppose it should work on more laptop, that kind of thing. It's used one in a Oh, nice. Oh, yeah. Did not explain how DNS actually works, but um, what it does. Not too terrible, I guess. There are two more things that we need to consider. Um, the first one is, where do we want to send DNS queries to? There, there are many options. We can do our own recursion, like the, the diagram that I showed, the animation. That's quite complicated, but we can do that. Uh, we can statically configure uh, a name server, the, the, the public resolvers, the, the, the codexes are quite popular for that. And some of them even support DNS over TLS which gives you uh, encryption on the transport. We might want to use the ones that we learned over DHCP or router advertisements. My, my laptop might have um, a Wi-Fi and a 4G connection at the same time. Um, I need to juggle that. If I want Wi-Fi, I probably don't want to send my DNS queries out of, over to 4G, that's silly. But all of these solutions, there, there was this only one single place where we configured this, so they're all fighting over um, an anti-resolve.com. And another consideration here is the, the, the privacy part, who can see what I'm asking for. And with the, uh, the, the if you do, if you talk to an upstream forwarder, if it's provided by DHCP or you uh, configure it by hand, then the, the, the server operator can see this, what you're asking for. Or a person in the middle can just sniff the traffic. If you put DNS over a TLS in the mix, then the, at least your path to the operator is encrypted, so someone on the path can't see this. But again, the, the server operator can see this. And presumably, maybe, if you're unlucky, it depends on how you do this, um, these curves can be correlated to you, uh, but the, the, the uh, DNS or TLS uh, resolver needs to talk to the internet, and if I can see observe that path, that might be correlated to me. For example, uh, if I run my own, and I'm the only one talking to this, that is trivial. Uh, whatever that thing is asking for, uh, that came from me. <laughs> uh, another uh, alternative is, well, we do our own recursion, and we have the QNAME minimization enabled. So someone who's close to my laptop can observe what I'm doing, but the authoritative name server is probably maybe not. The other thing is um, that, that you run into when you're uh, traveling around with your laptop is uh, captive portals. This is the thing 
you're on the free Wi-Fi and they want you to click on the thing and I accept your terms and services and I'm not evil and this is all good. But for that to work, they're they're playing evil tricks with DNS, uh, maybe with HTTP interception. And for it to really work all the time, at the, when, when you know that you're behind a captive portal, you need to talk to the DHCP service. You might, uh, DHCP provided name service, you might get around this. But usually what happens is you, you try to go to your site uh, and it intercepts this, redirects you to something that is not resolvable on the uh, open internet. And only on the, the name service that the DHCP lease uh, provides you can actually resolve this. <coughs> um, we will come back to that uh, later when that is important. So let's see what we can do about this. First, what did we do in the past? Uh, the, the, the simplest solution is um, yeah, just let the DH client do the thing. Um, it just owns uh, uh, resolve conf. You only have before name servers in there. Um, this will very likely get you past captive portals. Uh, if not, then the captive portal is just broken. So uh, this is the best you can do there. Um, you are, however, at the mercy of the whoever is running the uh, the recursive name server that's provided, and this thing might not actually be good. This thing might not be passed, um, and. You don't have any DNS support at all, uh, under the provision that you agree that you need to do the validation on your own laptop. What people then uh, to, to get around the oh di this uh, recursive name server that was handed to me is just terrible. I configure my own, like use one of the quad access uh, public uh, resolvers because they're quite fast. That's that's the argument there. This will very likely not get you past the portals uh, because. If the, the, the redirect is not resolvable on the public internet, um, you lost. So you start to fiddle around with things by hand. This will also not work in, in places where port 53 is, is, uh, is filtered. You just can't talk to the uh, to your uh, statically configured uh, name server. And again, no DNS. Then people thought, oh, well, this is cute. We have an uh, unbounded base. Uh, let's just fire that one up. It's a, it's a recursive resolver. Um, we, we tell the client again that uh, leave the uh, as resolve console alone. We, we take it over. Um, we can even get um, DNS over TLS now. Uh, we get DNSSEC validation. Again, it will not get you past captive portals uh, because well, you're not talking to the thing. And you run into problems where DNS is filtered. So again, you fiddle around with things. I looked at uh, what, what the FreeBSD is doing. They uh, have a resolve conf as a, as a daemon, which is an uh, upstream called open resolve, uh, which is a rework of a thing that uh, Debian did. Mm, from, from what I can work out from the, from the man page, uh, this, is, this is quite powerful. You, you can script it, and it can run scripts on, um, on events. It also has uh, provisions on how to reconfigure a recursive name server that you run on your local box when, when things change. Like uh, you get a new DHCP lease, you get scripted that it then fills those in as a, as a pull order. But from what I can tell, it doesn't come with batteries included. So you need to do all this setup and all this, this configuration, which is, is great if you want to do this admining work, but if you want it to just work, mm, that's not so nice. And this is where we end up with uh, unwind that to solve all these things. So unwind is a validating recursive name server that's supposed to run on your laptop. And it should always run. Which means that it must be at least as good as just doing the, the DH client points at the uh, DHCP provided uh, name servers, otherwise uh, people get annoyed. For, well, I said there are two to three thousand pages of RFC for DNS, so um, I could certainly not implement that uh, since December last year. So we are using libunmount for that, for the heavy DNS listing, which gives us a DMSSEC, uh, the, the, the recursion. It can talk to, um, you can configure a static forward to talk to this, to uh, those, and uh, it gives us a DNS over TLS. 
It is in the uh, tradition of open BSD you probably separate a daemon, uh, otherwise you probably would not even get it in. Um, it makes heavy use of pledge to run in a um, restrictive sort of operating mode, so if you violate your pledge promises, the thing does get killed. And it has a restricted view of the file system. Um, it just does not see anything else. So think of it kind of like maybe Django with a file in there, but this is more powerful. Also, go to Bob's talk about this. Um, what it then needs to do for it to always work, uh, it needs to um, passively monitor the, the local network if, uh, if things are changing there. Like, is the link going up and down? Uh, do I get a new DHCP lead? But it also needs to then figure out what is the actual quality. So I know the, the, the link just went up, but what does that mean? Uh, I need to check, can I actually talk DNS to the internet? So it does that. Let's have a look at the, uh, the details. So um, libunknown uh, is uh, developed by NLNetNav. They give us unknown, um, or also NSD. We have both of them in OpenBSD base. For technical reasons, Unwind has a local copy of uh, this part. Um, but we don't do any changes to it, so um, updates to it are uh, very easy. Every time we update uh, Unbound, we just uh, copy the things over. Also, if we need to do tiny changes, uh, upstream is, is very receptive to this, so we do not carry any local diffs. <coughs> Yeah, the privilege separated, um, which is the, the standard for all the, the network demons in OpenBSD. And if you uh, wanted to write a new one, um, just copy an old one, um, rip all the, the, the special parts out, and um, these days I can do it in uh, one to two hours to have a new one. The upshot here is it gives you all the, the, the benefits, um, the security benefits, um, full safe pattern. Gives you a config part where you can do config reload. Um, has, a, uh, has a logging uh, framework and there's a control process for this. Get all this uh, for free every yeah. <coughs> for privilege separation, it runs four processes: the parent process, uh, which starts up the uh, front end, um, capture portal process, and the resolver. In the parent process, we do all the, the privileged uh, operations like uh, open ports. Um, open files, and we pa pass open file descriptors then to the, uh, the other processes. Uh, the, the front end process hand talks to the network uh, via an open uh, port that gets handed in from the parent process. And um, So it gets a query over the service port, um, passes this on to the resolver process over um, uh, over a pipe. The, um, the resolver process resolves this for us and gives us the answer back, which we then send out uh, over EDP. When it comes up, it doesn't actually uh, have a service <coughs> port open. It starts to look around what's the current uh, network quality. And once it decides, oh, I can actually talk DNS, um, then it asks the parent process, please open uh, the, the, the port uh, for me. Um, the, the same happens when it uh, later on uh, finds out that it can no longer uh, talk DNS at all, then it asks the parent process to close the oh, Sorry, uh, It can actually close the port itself. Um, later on, more why that is a good thing. I'm going to skip this. The, yeah, the um, resolver process does all the uh, DNS uh, querying for us, but it also uh, checks different uh, resolving strategies for us, and it just decides on which is the best one. <clears throat> it also initiates the uh, captive portal checking. It uh, can find out that it, uh, or it knows when to ask uh, to find out if we're behind one. The captive portal is, is um, quite simple. It's, um, it gets an open socket from the parent process and it's uh, just an isolated uh, HTTP speaker. Uh, it sends a GET request and uh, expects a response, which can either be um, uh, HTTP status code or a boiler. And it then tells the resolver um, if we're behind the captive portal or not. 
mentioned you this uh, pledge and unmail. Um, but with pledge, you, you tell the kernel, I'm only going to use following uh, a set of syscalls, like with uh, the, the third I.O., um, I, I pledge that I will only operate on already open file descriptors. If you try something else, the, the process gets killed by the kernel. Um, the RNET pledge gives you the ability to talk to the internet uh, to, to open uh, more ports. And with uh, Unveiled, you get a restricted view of the file system. Uh, I think an example is beautiful there. So this is, these are the, the pledges that we have in the, in the processes. Um, so the present process is um, allowed to open uh, sockets to, to the internet or to open distance sockets if needed to do this for uh, port 53, for example. And it can also open uh, files for reading and pa pass them on to, to other processes. But there's no, no writing of any file. The front end process can only uh, work on uh, existing uh, open files, can receive them from the, from the parent process, and it can uh, accept connections on the control socket. That's the, what the uh, unit pledge is doing there. The resolver process is somewhat powerful because it actually needs to talk to the internet, so uh, it uh, is allowed to do that. And it's also allowed to read files. But we don't want it to read all over the file system. Uh, so we only unveil uh, the certificate um, bundle that we need for DNS over TLS uh, validation. So it can only see this one file. And the um, caps portal is very limited. It can only talk to open uh, file scripts and, and get them. So it will be quite difficult to get out of this with uh, data that, that you don't trust. About the monitoring of uh, the uh, network quality. Mm. So on one can do the following resolving strategies. It can do its own recursion. It can talk to DHCP provided uh, resolvers. It can talk to statically configured uh, forwards and it can do um, DNS over TLS for statically configured uh, resolvers. And now it needs to figure out which, which one is actually good. And what it does is it, it sends a query for a thing that is known to exist. So this, this is just a technicality. It knows that the root zone exists, and it knows that this thing is there. And it's also known that the root zone is signed. So we can depend on this. And if we get an answer, and we can validate the answer, then we know, uh, yeah, this thing actually allows the validation. Maybe we only get an answer but all the DNSSEC um, records are stripped. So this is not the validation fails. This is validation is just not available because the, the thing that you're talking to uh, does not uh, allow this. Then you arrive at a, um, a policy of resolving. If, we do, if you haven't checked it yet, we uh, end up with unknown. If you end, uh, run into a timeout, this is that. And this is then only uh, also um, both from the bottom, uh, from the top to the bottom, the, 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 the the best strategy, so this is uh, ordered in uh, quality. Uh, we always prefer one uh, that's validating over one that's resolving. We also keep uh, a histogram of response time. So everything that's uh, below uh, 10 milliseconds here, these uh, 1,000 uh, answers, they probably came from the cache. And this looks like we are having around uh, 40, 60 uh, milliseconds uh, response time at this particular location. The idea here is that we can use this to distinguish between um, uh, if we want to switch resolving strategies. If it's really terrible, like all your answers are uh, up there at 1,000 milliseconds response time, maybe, maybe you want to talk to something else. I also mentioned the, uh, the captive portal detection. <clears throat> this works by, um, you, you, configure, you need to configure a URL, and uh, yeah, it sends a GET request to that, and uh, it can expect a HTTP status code or a status code and a body or only a body. And while um, we get an answer that is not expected, or maybe we get a timeout, we decide, okay, we are behind a captive portal, and that short circuits the decision process 
to what should we talk to to always uh, only choose the DHCP uh, provided ones, no matter how terrible they are, because that's the thing that we need to talk to to get past this. And in the background, it uh, continuously reprobes to figure out, oh, someone actually clicked, yeah, yeah, I'm fine with the terms of service, and you've passed the thing. And it also comes with a, with a config file. But here's a neat thing. It actually works without one. Uh, if you don't give it a config file, um, it can do DHCP and its own recursion. If you want more, um, you need a config file. Unfortunately, we don't have a, a captive portal URL built in, so that's probably one of the things that where you want a config file. You can um, configure the, the, the preference uh, if you so decide. And uh, a static uh, forward and you can also enable uh, DNS over DLS. That's the last one there. And you can give it a authentication name for, um, so you, you configure your name service with uh, IP address, otherwise you end up with a, a chicken and egg problem. What, how, how are you supposed to then uh, validate a cert that you're getting back? So you need to tell it, expect this, which is the authentication name. I mentioned that it needs to be at least as good as talking to DH, uh, as, uh, if we we're back in the, yeah, DH client um, owns ABC resolve cons. And this has also to do with, we don't open the port immediately on, on 53. So we arrange a resolve cons like this, where we uh, first list local host, and then we list the name service that the DHCP uh, client got. And um, the upshot here is that the, uh, the C library uh, resolver it tries to talk to 127, but if nothing is listening there, it will immediately fall over to the, um, uh, the next two. There is no timeout there. It immediately gets um, uh, port unreachable and there's talk to another thing. This is not there. Um, Dutch railway system. They have a. <laughs> <laughs> so we are using the bundle, uh, which means that we cannot disable EDS zero option, which is a technicality. You, you, it always sends an EDS zero option with the query, and what the the middle box on the Dutch rails does, it sees EDS zero, and whatever you ask the damn thing. It responds with what you're asking for does not exist, like always, and we, we, we can't get around this. And then what we then do is we uh, disable port 53 and we talk directly to the thing. The, the C library does not send uh, ENS zero, and we get past it. Yes, internet is terrible. Okay. <laughs> ENS zero is coming from the button down. Yes, which is important. Yes, it is. Yeah, I, I, I've tried running recursive resolvers locally on my laptop by I think a thousand bags of hacks before, and this is the trick that actually makes it work because there's always some place it just does not fucking work because they have blocked it. Yep. Yeah. And you might run into something else where it decides, oh, this is weird. Uh, we are not talking to you. So but this you, is the fallback. You don't even notice when this yeah. goes away because the lib C resolver will work. Or it's a bucket of the series over there. Yeah, 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 then we have another maintainer who needs to fix this. <laughs> I'm actually quite fast here. Nice. Um, if you want to port the thing, um, I think these are mostly the, the thing that kind of makes it it's not portable. Um, it uses to, to figure out that. Um, the interface change, uh, interface state changes, and it needs to uh, reread the, um, uh, the the release file to get at the name service there. Uh, it reads this from the route socket. <coughs> I'm not entirely sure if the other BSDs they do have route socket, but I'm not entirely sure if you get that information there. Um, also, I'm not entirely sure where the release file might actually end up. So. Either this stuff works, or maybe it can be hacked around in, in uh, unwanted control um, and just add the, 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 the feature there, like 
yeah, use those names or that kind of thing. Um, if you don't, well, you probably will have a path to fetch an unrail. Um, one way to get around that is just count the point at zero and arrange for a change rule where you have access to the, the, the third key as a document file. Or you can treat Fletch and Unveil as annotations to figure out how your own sandboxing facility can avoid this. So, question about the captive portal. Oh. Oh, I talked to the DMCP provider, uh, the name server. Right. Oh, sorry. The question is, uh, why is there a captive portal detection? Um, so if you point yourself behind a captive portal and you decide, uh, I do my own recursion, uh, then you might end up in a situation where you don't get the, um, yes, I t accept your terms and services page. Okay, so for as long as we're behind the captive portal, you treat it as DNS is going to be locally? Yes. That's what I was trying to Okay, okay. So that's not in, in any of the pen pages. Sorry. <laughs> so then does the does it switch the entire system resolver over and then keep checking the do I have access to the internet page using the other resolvers? Or are those when does it switch back after it notices the capture portal is passed? Well, that's one part of the Yes, it periodically rechecks, um, it does a GET request, and when it gets the, the, the response that it wants, uh, then it uh, switches to whatever you have configured. So if switching to the DHCP name servers makes the internet work, yes. then does it start realizing the page works and then switch off halfway through the terms and services page? Yeah. No, 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 no. Because uh, when, when you get the presented the terms of, uh, terms of services page, the internet is just is not working yet. So if you uh, in the in the background it does get request to the, the configured uh, checker, and w when you have not clicked the thing yet, it will get back. Uh, no, 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 you're not talking to the internet. There's no race to lose. Okay. Yeah. I think I was done with this slide. Huh? An idiot. Yeah. Wow. Some future work. Um, we had this, this cute idea that we want to have this broadcast mechanism where all the sources that tell us, here is the name server that you can ask, um, converge. So we, 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 we currently parse the HTTP leads files, that's just ugly. What are we doing with uh, router advertisements that give us uh, v6 name servers? What are we doing with the, uh, the 4G modem? Uh, that gives us in a completely horrible way of uh, the name servers. Um, the idea is to just put this on the route socket, we listen on this, and uh, we get the information out of there. Mm, if we have that, then it kind of gives us the, uh, the name servers on the route advertisement uh, for free. Mm, some people pointed out that you need per network configuration. So you, you're wandering around, um, you're at home, you're traveling, everything is nice, you do your own recursion. Then you, uh, then you come to the office where they do a thing called a split horizon DNS. It's kind of like the Catholic portal where uh, if you want to resolve certain things, you need to talk to the DHCP uh, provided name servers. Like you enter the office, you want to print. The printer is only resolvable by talking to these things. So it should be possible to, tech, to, to detect this uh, situation. There are multiple ideas on how we can do this. Uh, the, the first one that I'm going to implement, and I'm halfway there, is it sees to which SSID you're connected. And it just uses a different uh, config. Another idea was, and this gets more and more crazy, look on what layer three address your uh, gateway is. Look on which layer two address your gateway is. Ask the 4G modem's GPS where you are. No, we are not implementing that one. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's a different approach. My
Yes. Are you, um, are you aware of an online NSA trigger and or are you cooperating with uh, with them on this? The question was, am I aware of NLNet Lab via NetSec trigger? What was it called? Yeah. The NetSec trigger. Is yeah. there is an implementation that is unbound for the bit of magic that detects via VHCP um, whether there is a captive portal and um, allows to uh, enable validation over a VOT for example? I was not aware of this, no. Okay. I will have a look. It exists as uh, packages for, for Windows, for Mac, for Linux. Okay, thank you. Yes. How do you decide, or do you decide, on whether to do streamline minimization or not, or do you leave that up to the list or not? The question was when do we decide to do genome minimization, and uh, the answer is uh, we leave it up to the bottom line. It seems to do this correctly. Another question, if I may? Yes. Are you going to, or are you, have you thought about um, some form of indication to the user, I don't know, that um, NSSEC validation has been disabled or downgraded? Yes, uh, so the, the question was, uh, is there any indication to the, the user that uh, the NSSEC validation has been downgraded? Um, so on a, on a protocol level, it, it does the right thing. It does not uh, claim uh, in, in the, the flag that this was actually a validated answer, um, which is not a terribly good uh, user indicator because you can't see this. Um, you can also see it in the um, in the control process uh, uh, with the control tool. You can ask Libanon, uh, sorry, you can ask Unwind, what are you currently doing? What what, what are the states? Um, So it, it speaks a, a specific uh, binary protocol, um, and this can be uh, implemented, or we can implement it here that it's a machine possible. Because for people that use things like i3 bar, it would be interesting to have a condensed version of that in your status bar. Yes. Uh, you can the, just talk on the, on the unwind CTL socket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, the question was, is there a machine possible output for this and for, for like your, your window manager? Because, well, yeah. Um, so why would you? run the control program line by hand, that's, uh, you, you really need to have this uh, um, uh, more in your face that uh, something happens. Are we talking from over there? I was going to point out that if it's anything except medium 443 and 22, it's whitelisted, not blacklisted. Uh, that's the latest information I have. Well, 53 also works, otherwise the oh, yeah. cursor would not be validating. Yes. One point where you talked about capture portal detection, you said this is the light shaft from hell. Yes. Uh, can you not adopt uh, a solution like, for example, the Cisco VPN client, which simply calls the shell script? Do whatever the hell you want in the shell script. Return me some. Oh, no, 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 no. Like but that, no, no. Yeah, sure, we could do that, but that does not solve the problem. Um, what we want is to have this. Work automatically without a config file. Oh. <laughs> a built in URL, check this URL. Uh, you, you can choose uh, to which evil corp you want to talk to. They, they all have one, but we cannot agree on uh, to which one we talk. Everybody has an opinion on this. No, 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 Google is evil. No, 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 the, the other ones are evil. No, no, no. We need to talk to Yandex. What's that? Misunderstood what you said. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Anything else? 
Where is the log? The log? Yes, just log. Or do you mean uh, query logging? No, just log is fine. Yeah, yeah. It's also good to search log. You need to crank the. Uh, the, the question was, is there a, um, where does where does query log go? And yes, this goes to search log. You need to crank the verbosity uh, to higher. <laughs> so this broke something I use at home I, I, when I turned it on, and I like it elsewhere. But at home, I redirect all my my resolvers in Google to my local recursive resolver running unbound on my gateway, which then has a giant list of logon on filters on it, murders all of Google AdWords, malware sites, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This effectively goes around that for me at all. <laughs> no, it's, it's cool. I like it because I don't block DNS out. Short of blocking the external resolver, which I could do on my guest network, yeah. and that's actually probably the best solution for me is to actually just, just dump all 53 of my guest network. And then it would probably then it would just fall back to using my yeah. local resolver yeah. just as fast, and I'd be happy. So I guess that, I guess I should just um, I'll write block fifty three. That's one option, or the the feature where it, uh, it detects where you are. And yeah, then and I can I can change. So if you would fiddle with the preference there, you would just pull out the DHCP one. Um, also, there was a hackathon going on before here, and um, I implemented a block list and uh, unwind as uh, well. So I could suck the my same block list. Yeah. Into which is a bit silly for, for you to use case, I guess. But then you also have it on the road. <laughs> yeah, then I have it on the road. How far are, how far away is this from being usable for not just my own personal use on a laptop, but being a useful resolving name server for say my four hundred thousand users? It will never be now. Okay, cool. Th that's not the point. Uh, so if you have four hundred thousand users run Unbound or yeah. whatever you want. Um, you yeah. control the network then. So this, pro so, so Unbound has uh, the... No, I don't. <laughs> well, it, you kind of maybe should, I don't know. No, but uh, so the, what, what Unbound is trying to do, and there's also optimization going on in this direction, it assumes a certain quality of the network, which you, it runs in a data set, it runs on a, pro uh, a server. If you then try to shoehorn this on your laptop, then that's where you run into problems because it's assumed Everything is shiny. Uh, there's a um, there's a sysadmin who constantly uh, does things to it. When that fails, you're in trouble and you start to fiddle with this. And this is the niche that Unwind tries to solve. So it will never try to replace that. Okay. I think we're getting kicked out again.